This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, we are fortunate to have a guest, Reshmi Saxena. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for your leadership. Thank you for all you do to make a difference in people's lives. Thank you very much. So I wanted to ask you a question before I uh, uh, before you will have a chance to say something, please tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your experience as one of the pioneers of women's journalism, especially I know you work with the Stan Times, the Sunday Times and Telegraph. You also been involved with the SPS as a part of the, in, uh, um, it's called India Review Analysis, I guess I'm right. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, when I started off as a cub reporter training there were no women in the newsroom. That itself was a challenge. First to get accepted in spite of having topped the interview and the written test was my first hurdle because there was a sort of resistance to having women as reporters. They thought that women were in, this was I'm talking about 1971. They thought that women were just not capable of doing the rough assignments as they called it. And so why would they just add one more person to the team who couldn't do everything? Anyway, I managed to convince them. And I must tell you, Frank, those days we had to prove that we were better than the men to be accepted. It was just <laughs> not good enough to be as good as them. So uh -huh. I had to go out of my way and plead with uh, my news editor and my chief reporter to give me assignments which went beyond uh, baby shows and flower shows. Wow. And then I, <laughs> so every step of the way, it was quite a ride. But I must say it was smooth. It had its tears, but it also had its joys. Because those days, the seniors, once they had accepted you in the team, went out of their way to encourage you, to teach you. They literally sat with you and taught you how to cover assignments, how to improve your copy. And that has been such a learning experience, which has you know, stood me in uh, good uh, stead all these 48 years that I have been uh, reporting. Oh my goodness. And gradually, yes, gradually it was going up the rung step by step. And today now, thankfully, with the help of my colleagues and seniors, I'm now a resident editor of the Hitwad, which is uh, English daily brought out from the state of Madhya Pradesh. And it's about 100 years old now, Frank. Wow. So it, despite all the promises, potentials, and possibilities, you uh, face a lot of challenges, hostility, sexual assault. And uh, how you're able to overcome those challenges and move forward? There was only one way out of this, and that was your own performance. You just had to show that you could do not only what the men reporters could do, but probably do it a notch better. And the only way to do it was to clamor for assignments which were considered challenging. And if, with every assignment, one had to prove oneself. You know, like I was the first woman crime reporter in Delhi. They thought that women just couldn't do crime reporting. Not only did my office and staff think so, but even the police department thought that, you know, what were women doing in a uh, police headquarter, which did not even have a washroom for women, you know. So the first thing I had to do was to be accepted. And in those days, Frank, you know, now that I look back, what we had to do was instead of behaving like women, we had to behave like the men. We had to sit on roadsides, have cups of tea, uh, use the sort of language they were using, backslapping, because that is what made you accept them, accept you as one of them. But once you had done that, then it was time to stand your ground and say, look, boy, now I'm going to set the rules. And that's I how can, I can do it. Too. I can do it too, right? So, so there's still some barriers. So, so you paved the path for the future woman journalist and you have empowered them to be the best they can be. Am well, I correct? It would, it would sound a bit arrogant to accept what you say. But yes, we did make it make space for other women to come in. But that again, Frank, had to do a lot with your performance. I'll give you an example. We had a surrender by Dacoits uh, in 1975, 
uh, near Agra. And um, none of the male reporters seemed very keen to go there. And I went up to my news editor and said, look, I want to cover this assignment, but I don't want to cover it on the day of the surrender. I want to go there two, three days earlier, mix with the people over there, and then do stories before the actual surrender took place. So you won't believe we, I had to trek seven to 10 kilometers from where the police cordon started, because this was a sanitized area, because these deployments were coming in to negotiate with the government and the NGO, which was bringing about the surrender. And when I trekked and I landed up there, these guys just looked at me and said, what are you doing here? So I said, well, <laughs> you don't belong here. You don't belong here, right? <laughs> yeah, and you can't throw me. And they couldn't send me back because that is what the security demand was. So for three days, I had to sleep in a temple. But it oh. gave me the best of stories. I met these dacoits who had millions of dollars as reward on their head. They were coming, negotiating. I even went uh, horseback with one of them to see what it was like. And it was great fun. And we, I, my stories made the front page every day. But to have my story delivered, I had to trek another seven kilometers, hand over my copy to the driver who would take it to Agra Hotel from where I had made friends with the manager who would read it out on the phone to my office in Delhi and then they would be able to use it. So it's only when well, you I did can, things like this, you were accepted. Uh, I can relate to your charms, cheers, changes and challenges. Uh, because when I, when I started my business, there were a lot of obstacles and challenges that I faced being an immigrant, being from India. Uh, there was, there were, uh, but you know what? One thing that, uh, that I was able to, uh, uh, something that I had something that was a challenge that I felt very strongly that I could realize the American dream if I aim high, work hard, and pursue my dream. But the, but the people who did not accept me, it didn't really matter that much to me because that gave me the strength and courage to continue on to be the best I can be, and which is what you did. That's, That's a wonderful. That's uh, uh, So what has been your success story being a journalist? Uh, I know there have been some sad days, some happy days. There have been some situations where it have been dangerous, unpredictable. Like a new day every day, and a new assignment, and new. Then it's like taking a, uh, taking an exam every day, because you're also going to be com your copy is going to be compared with what your other colleagues in other newspapers have done. So you have to day in and day out with every copy prove yourself, and that is what actually I think makes a reporter finally grow into becoming an analyst, and then uh, doing copy which is more than spot reporting. But unless I feel you have been through this rigorous exercise, it really doesn't help. And unfortunately, what is happening in India today in journalism is that you have lots of people who come in, they literally parrot drop you know, into political reporting. They really haven't seen the rough uh, tumble of other sort of reporting. And uh, I personally feel that that is what gave me the um, the skills to even use the same sort of uh, tenacity for investigation, for digging news, even when I'm uh, doing now political reporting, I use the same tools and I really think it helps. Well, uh, thank you very much. So I know you, uh, there have been a lot of discussions. I, I was able to Google your name and found that you wrote a book called The Story of Women Militants of India. So I have two questions. Why did you write this book? What, when was it published? Do you why these women are drawn into the dark and desperate of militancy and the terrorism? What, so what, what, motivates, what motivates them to do what they do? Go so ahead. your first question is that uh, why did I choose to write about them? You know, you'll be surprised. I'd be toying with this, not really toying with the idea. But these women were somewhere there in my mind because I used to come across references to them even when I was doing political reporting. I know it's difficult to imagine how the connection is, but I'll give you the give you an example. When I was covering uh, elections in various states which have this problem, 
I would always hear people talk about or oh, the role of women, how women are coming out and uh, these are they belong to these insurgent groups. They are motivating people or intimidating them. But then, you know, or sometimes like when I went to Andhra Pradesh, I was doing a story on the plight of the handloom weavers. And there was a reference. People said, oh, you know, these houses where you see tiled roofs and they are well to do are, uh, people, are families where the daughters have gone in to Nagzal camps. And so there's a steady flow of income. So there were these references, even in Kashmir, everywhere. But, you know, that was not my story of the day. And I didn't sort of start to investigate that. Even when I was doing covering foreign affairs, we had the case of a woman who was caught in the Pakistan High, Pakistan High Commission taking money, and uh, which was meant for terrorists. So you know, there were references to these women, but I just never had the time to pursue those cases. Now, uh, my book was published uh, in uh, June this year. It came out in June this year, 24th of June. And uh, I had this time now that I was not doing day-to-day -day reporting to be able to really start working on the, uh, you know, finding out about these women. And at the same time, Frank, I saw women be hitting the headlines internationally. You know, we had the Paris bomb blast. We had, before that, we'd had a assassination of our former prime minister, Rajiv Gandhi, where a woman was the human bomb. So, you know, I just thought to myself, is the role of women in these groups changing? Why is it happening? I didn't realize it was going to take me three years to research this. But when I started, I realized it was so difficult to find these women. And once you had even found them, to get them to talk, to share their story. And uh, it was easier, actually, to have gone into the camps and talked to women who were still active. But that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to talk to women who had lived this life, come out of it, and could sit back and reflect on what they had done. And as I was doing this, I realized how important was the role of women in insurgency. And I came to the conclusion that no insurgency can survive without the help of women, because they really are given assignments, which I feel the men can't actually do. They really Very keep well. the insurgency alive. They keep the hope alive and, and well. And if I may add another line, is that Please. also when I spoke to these women, I realized that they now actually made a great constituency for peace. They had seen all the violence, the killing, they'd been on the run, they had been ambushing people, and they had now taken a stand that, look, we got out of all this because we want to have a family, we want to have children, and our children must not live in troubled times. So I thought that if the policymakers in our country would also start to look at these women, address them. Maybe they would find a better solution to hammer out a peace agreement. And, you know, surprisingly and unfortunately, these women are missing when it comes to the negotiating table. Even their own leaders don't bring them to the forefront of talks with the government. Uh, let me let me change, uh, shift the gears and talk about uh... Uh, you know, India is the world's largest democracy. America is the world's uh, oldest democracy. Those are the values that binds us together. Has it been fun? It has been challenging uh, to to cover the political landscape of India. And what role do journalists play in the democracy? And uh, do they find the facts? You see, I think covering uh, democracy is one of the greatest privilege a journalist can have. Because when I hear of stories, you know, where journalists have to operate in very challenging situations that is vis-a-vis -vis government control, I realize how difficult it must be. But at the same time, there's another challenge when you're covering a democracy. There has to be a certain maturity and there also has to be a certain sense of duty and purpose. Why are you writing? You know, to be able to keep that maintain that thin line that divides your work from sensationalizing news and giving news and analyzing it. That's the very difficult road to follow. 
See, if you're in a country where there's no democracy and there's government control, you already know what you can write and what you can't. But in a democracy, you're taking that decision with every people. And at the same time, when you don't sensationalize, you also have to remember that you, this journalist, as a journalist, you're not a cheerleader of the government. You are actually, uh, you know, the fourth you're pillar, which the is, yes, you have to point out where you think the authorities that be are going wrong, whether it's only the authorities or it's the civil society or whatever. And that is where I feel the maturity and sense of duty comes in, not to uh, sensationalize facts, yet not to hold back. That is the challenge every day. Uh, what are your thoughts on the freedom of press in India these days? Do you really think that journalists face censorship from the government? As you know, the, the freedom of press is a cornerstone of democracy, is a pillar of the democracy, and press is vital for a vibrant democracy. India remains a vibrant democracy because of the resilience, the questioning of the Indian journalist. So I want you to shed some light on that. On, do you have a powerful platform to stand on and to separate the facts from fiction? There is no official censorship, but the press at the moment is under a lot of stress and there is a real challenge ahead because somehow this Modi-led government refuses to understand that the job of a journalist or the media is to watch down. Criticism does not mean that you are anti them. We are just trying to live up to our role of being the watchdog. We are not the cheerleaders. You have your government agencies, which is the Press Information Bureau, to take out, to address your line, to make it public and take it to the people. That's not the job of a free media. But having said that, there is no official censorship as there was during the emergency, which was imposed by the late Mrs. Indira Gandhi, which lasted for some months. And most of the media at that time had no choice but to succumb because it was an offic official censorship. And they did fall flat. When they were asked to bend, they groveled. That's sad to say, but that's what happened. Um, I know I have one more question, but if you have time, I'll ask about the what's going on in the political landscape in terms of the election, which is 2019. It's kind of hard to predict right now. But before I ask that question, uh, uh, it, it's something that uh, is near dear to me. Um, the increase in tolerance, uh, hostility, and prejudice against the minority, do you think they are isolated cases, that they are being overplayed? As you know, the foundation, the future of India rests upon the diversity and tolerance. And, and this type of ugly, intolerant behavior by certain individuals or organization does not reflect the values, the character and conscience of a nation that has been a champion of, uh, of not only democracy, but secularism all around the globe. There have been global beacon of hope for secularism. So shed some light I on have to I have to Go sadly ahead. accept and confess that the society in India today is totally polarized on communal lines. And this has been done because, as you know very well, the Bharatiya Janta Party, which is in power and leads the NDA coalition, basically is the political arm of the RSS. And the RSS has its own agenda, which it has had right from the beginning, of having a Hindu nation. For them, that is the declared agenda. And this agenda has been now used through their political arm, which is the BJP. And therefore, you see this immense polarization. And it's almost become fashionable now to say in India, which is such a sad situation, that no, I'm not secular. I believe in Hindutva. I believe that the minorities should learn to live in peace with the majority. Now, this sort of conversation was a big no-no 15 years ago, you no respectable educated person wanted to have this sort of a discussion. Now, the great change that has come is that people now proudly say that, no, we don't believe in secularism. The secularism of the type which was practiced by the Congress, which actually meant pampering the minorities. 
So now they feel that the, the minorities have been pampered by other political parties. They have been developed as a vote bank. So now it is time to strike back. And therefore you see that the entire political narrative is based on polarizing the situation further, polarizing the society further, so that they can consolidate the vote bank. Don't forget the BJP when it started had a committed core vote bank, but they have expanded that. They have brought in people on the basis of their campaign for Hindutva. And therefore you hear of these very tra tragic incidents of people lynching the so-called cow smugglers. You have people who are saying, no, this is against uh, the culture of India and therefore you should not be dancing or you should not be celebrating Valentine's Day. It's a European concept. Now, this sort of thing is new for people like me of my generation because we've lived in a very free, secular society. You see what has happened, Frank, is that this whole communal divide is now the thin line is got blurred and merged with nationalism. It's almost like saying you're anti-national if you do not believe in Hindutva. That and that is going to be the narrative right up to the general elections. Wow. Uh, but uh, what I hear from you, uh, you said very eloquently, they're tearing apart the harmonious fabric of India. They don't, uh, it seems to me there's no understanding that the that the if the minorities are Dalit, which is 400 million people succeed, India succeed, all of us succeed, the world succeed. And I, it seems to me, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Frank, your question here. Uh, uh, it, it seems to me that the that the if we are strong, we if we are together, we are stronger. And when we're stronger, we can help shape a better future for India. So India should be united by common hope of, uh, I consider, equal treatment and better tomorrow. Go well, ahead. I totally agree with you. But what is happening there, what is happening internally is also fueled, fueled by <laughs> external factors. You have this great Wahhabi uh, culture being transported from Saudi Arabia and into Saudi India. Arabia, yes. Yes. You also have Pakistan playing its role in all this. And therefore, you see also the minority community, that is the Muslims in India, becoming more radical and therefore becoming a little more strident and aggressive, which really doesn't go well uh, down well with those who actually believe in the secular fabric. So it's not that there is only one side to blame. They are both, and both uh, communities are being played by political interests, outside money, and other factors. And therefore, this whole situation is so tragic. And unfortunately, even the opposition parties, the main opposition party like the Congress, has realized that if they keep talking about secularism, their vote bank keeps shrinking. So they've also, to some extent, started to follow the soft Hindutva, as they call it. So it really is really tearing the fabric of this uh, society into shreds. And what I fear is that it's going to take a very long time for things to be brought back to normal or to what it used to be, because the damage that is going to is being done is not going to get repaired in the next five, 10 years, even if there is a change of government, because this whole communal attitude has percolated right down to the grassroots, to the villages, and to the common man. That's a, that's a shameful and sad, right? So, so where we go from here? Do you see a brighter horizon when you're enduring the storm? I feel that the BJP, and I think they are beginning to realize that you know they cannot win only up, uh, with the, the Hindu. By, by, by divisiveness, by divisiveness. Go yeah, ahead. not at all. They have to also bring in progress and development. You see, economic stability and progress has become a big issue for the new generation in India. Now you see, they are exposed to the outside world through television, through travel, and they see the lifestyle in other countries, which is so good compared to what they, the ordinary human uh, man, uh, human uh, in uh, India has to live through. They have their aspirations. They are no longer bothered only about 
these other issues for them employment economic stability is now priority number 1 so the bjp will have to bring this uh, into the narrative and i feel if the, if the economy improves and there is more employment the social conditions improve maybe the people will not have time for this divisive uh, politics and the uh, society being uh, divided on communal lines then it will be all a question of economic prosperity and that should be the highlight of everything that will be the hope for tomorrow they will bring people together and so yes. you have uh, you believe that the next generation is the hope for india's tomorrow absolutely i always feel that and i've always felt that that whichever party wants to come to power has to understand and recognize the aspirations of the younger generation what are they looking for they want to see their own country you know a big player on the international scene they want to live in comfort they want to have a good economic standard a good lifestyle that is what they are looking for and if any party can give them that they are the winners all the way the very well said uh, uh since president obama is a good friend uh, when we started with the campaign in back in 2000 uh, i believe it was 7 uh, and 8 he 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 energized and excited the new generation the younger generation and they were the people who really helped him to get to the next height to become president of the united states obviously a lot of other people helped but they were the key driver to make that happen so i would say that the prime minister as well as the other people in the bjp party has to bring in the new generation to make a difference and they uh, i hope i hope they do i hope so, so. and so should the main opposition party uh, look at this after all we have rahul gandhi who is a youngster and let's not very, forget in the 2000 uh, elections modi was able to woo this new generation and that's how he came in with such a resounding victory now if uh, rahul gandhi wants his party to be the main opposition party this is the group and the vote bank he has to look at very well said well thank you very much reshmi for your time and uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us uh, you have been very eloquent uh, you have expressed your views very well this is frank islam wishing you a great week and thank you for watching